Um, so, uh, well, it's uh, eight o'clock, so we'll, well. we'll start. So I'm going to, uh, have you, you, you've muted everybody, uh, Avril, yeah? No. No, uh, right. Okay, well, I have just muted everybody except for Avril. Right, okay. So Avril, if you will start the recording for me, please. Okay. Okay, welcome everybody to the uh, Tchelet Inspiring Judaism uh, Medical Ethics course, part one. Um, I'm hoping that uh, this will be of interest to everybody who's joined. We've got a, almost 100 people, uh, if you include the doubles on the computer uh, program. Um, so it's going to be a little bit unwieldy if everybody um, speaks at once. So I'm just going to go through with you how uh, I'm going to uh, administer this with Avril's help. Um, and, uh, and then you'll know how, uh, uh, how, how to react. So uh, each week uh, I will send you a, a course sheet, sent you the first one already. Hopefully you've seen it and got it with you or available. Um, we're going to discuss, or I'm going to discuss, the uh, subject matter for a little while. I'm then going to give you a, uh, um, a case example, um, and I'm going to break you out into rooms uh, of probably approximately five to seven people in each room, um, which means it will, you will leave uh, this room and go into another room, as it were, with five or seven other people. Uh, and you'll discuss the case uh, at hand between you. Uh, you'll appoint a spokesperson uh, who will, when we've finished chatting about that in your rooms, which will probably take about 10 or 15 minutes to go through uh, the various points that you want to raise, uh, your spokesperson will then uh, uh, identify themselves when we come back into the room. We won't have time for every room to give their opinion every time because uh, we've got a lot we'll have a lot of rooms to go through but we'll try and get um, everybody's opinion uh, at least once or twice throughout the course um, and then we'll see how how we get on in uh, discussing the issues that are raised by our case and then at the end of that I'm going to give you uh, the halachic aspect the Jewish aspect to the case um, and try and then wrap it all up uh, with um, some summary of, of what we've done through the session. Uh, after that, uh, those that want to uh, disappear can disappear. Uh, those that want to stay and ask questions or debate various points, uh, I'm happy to do that. Um, and the beauty of Zoom, of course, is you can leave when you want and nobody really knows. Uh, you can scoot out if you've had enough. Uh, or you can stay on and as long as you want because you don't have to get stuck in the traffic on the way home. So uh, that's, uh, that's how it's going to run uh, sort of housekeeping wise. Uh, those of you that have questions, you've got two choices. Either jot them down on a piece of paper uh, and then we'll talk about them at the end. Or you can click on the chat bubble and uh, write in your question in the chat. I'll try and keep my eye on the chat as we're going along. And if I can deal with the question as we're going along, I will. Uh, otherwise, we'll leave it till the end and, and go through them then. Um, so uh, uh, that, that's the, uh, the plan for the session. Um, and uh, before we start on the actual material, um, I just want to welcome everybody here. We are truly intercontinental. Uh, we are spanning a, uh, uh, a time zone of 12 hours. We go from uh, the West, going from the West, we have some uh, people from New York. I don't know if we've got anybody further West than New York, but we've got New Yorkers. Um, and going East, we've got some Australians as well. And we've got everyone in between. We've got some uh, English folk. We've got lots of Israeli folk. 
Um, and so we are truly intercontinental and we've got some South Africans as well, I can see. So uh, um, we are truly intercontinental. This is the advantage of having this on Zoom and uh, it means that we don't just limit ourselves to the local people. So there is some good has come out of this revolting, horrible, nasty Corona business that at least we now all know how to work Zoom uh, and we can have meetings like this where uh, everybody can enjoy uh, uh, education and learn uh, across uh, international borders. So again, just before I start on the material, I want to just put a little bit of a health warning out there. Um, we may well be touching on issues which some people may find uh, a little distressing. Uh, they may be scenarios which they uh, feel are a little close to home that they may have uh, been involved in themselves with uh, family members or their own particular medical issues. Uh, none of this is uh, intended to be uh, specific to any individual person. If there are cases which I have uh, brought out, all the cases that we're going to discuss are real live cases. They're not made up. They are things that have, uh, I have been involved in in the last uh, 30 years. Um, but if there are cases that are a little bit too close to home for, for people, please feel free to uh, absent yourself and uh, it's not intended to cause any distress at all. The second thing is that uh, as far as halakha is concerned, we are going to be discussing principles um, which uh, I would caution you against applying those principles yourself in your own situations, if you have halachic questions of a medical ethical issue, um, then uh, you need to approach a, a competent authority in that field. Uh, I can help you with that if, uh, if any of you have that situation. Um, okay, so that's the, uh, the background. Uh, let's start by um, asking ourselves the question, what is medical ethics? Well, let's ask the question, first of all, what is ethics? Um, if you were to ask uh, my son-in-law that, he'd tell you it was a county in the south of England. But uh, that's not the ethics that we're talking about. We're going to be talking about the ethics, uh, meaning morals and meaning uh, questions of ethical uh, moral issues that are raised. Medical ethics, of course, is a particular subject which is as old as the hills, uh, because every time that there are uh, medical questions arise, then there are ethical issues which, are, uh, uh, which arise with them. Uh, um, Charlie Simonoff has just said a message here, which I thoroughly endorse, uh, and uh, we will do exactly that. We will dedicate this session uh, to a refuah shalema to two of the giants of, uh, of Anglo Jewry and world Jewry, who are unfortunately both unwell. Uh, and that is um, uh, Lord Rabbi Jonathan Sachs and uh, Diane Hanoch Ehrentroy, both of whom are uh, unwell at the moment. And we dedicate our learning to, their, uh, to them uh, with the prayer that they should have a Rafur Shalema uh, um, very speedily and a complete recovery. Uh, from their illnesses. Thank you, Charlie, for reminding me on that. So medical ethics goes right back to the beginning uh, of medicine. Let me show you this young man here on my screen. I'm hoping that you can see that young man on my screen. Uh, and that is Hippocrates. Okay, I don't know if it really looked like that, but that's what somebody thinks that Hippocrates looked like. Hippocrates, of course, is famous for uh, the Hippocratic Oath, which uh, is that. The Hippocratic Oath, which uh, doctors uh, were meant to swear when they qualified. Uh, I didn't, as it so happens. I don't know if any of the doctors who were with us actually took the Hippocratic Oath when they qualified. I didn't. Uh, but that's partly because I never turned up for my uh, uh, my graduation ceremony. But uh, I did graduate, by the way, but I just never turned up for the ceremony. Um, so that's what uh, Hippocrates says. Let me show you uh, a little bit of uh, a little bit easier to look at. Uh, and there it is. 
uh, I have highlighted in red uh, a particular part of the Hippocratic Oath. You can look up the Hippocratic Oath yourself by going onto Google and putting in Hippocratic Oath. You'll have lots of different pictures. But this is the uh, translation of the Hippocratic Oath. The bit in red that I have done uh, is deliberate because we're going to be discussing this particular aspect of uh, medical ethics this week. Uh, and he says, I will use those dietary regimens which will benefit my patients according to my greatest ability and judgment. I will do no harm or injustice to them. Neither will I administer a poison to anybody when asked to do so, nor will I suggest such a course. Similarly, I will not give a woman a pessary to cause abortion, but I will keep pure and holy both my life and art. So the, the main part of that I wanted to uh, highlight here was this bit that says, I will do no harm or injustice to them. That was Hippocrates, um, who lived a very long time ago, and uh, the Hippocratic Oath, which until recently doctors did uh, swear, um, indicates to us that the, one of the first things we will do, first, do no harm. Um, there's a more modern version of this, which was uh, brought together by uh, an American uh, uh, organization uh, for new doctors, which goes something like this. Uh, now as a new doctor, I solemnly promise that I will do to the best of my ability to serve humanity, etc. And again, in red there on the screen, I shall never intentionally do or administer anything to the overall harm of my patients. So um, that seems to be a, a fundamental principle, which is uh, uh, as old as the hills. So let's have a look at something else now, uh, which tell which is as old as the hills as well and indicates to us that we have to uh, be ethical in the way that we behave. Um, I want to try and share my screen with you over here um, and I wonder whether you can see this screen now. Can you see my screen with a bit of Hebrew writing on it? No, you can't see. That. Oh, yes, you can. Right. OK. Now, I have uh, put, put forward for you here one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five quotes from Sefer Dvarim, the book of Deuteronomy. Um, and in red, I have uh, highlighted the common parts of these uh, verses. Uh, and you've got the English translation there as well. Uh, in the book of Dvarim, five times within a few chapters, we are told one way or another, ve'asita et atov v'ayashar, ayashar v'atov be'enei Hashem. You shall do that which is upright and good in the eyes of God. Uh, and it's, a, it's mentioned five times in very short shrift there. Uh, and the reason that it's mentioned five times, of course, is because it's very important. Uh, but why is it there when we are told, let's just look at the first one here. The first one says, diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God, his testimonies, his statutes, which he has commanded you. And you shall do that which is proper and good in the eyes of the Lord. So you would ask, well, surely if the first verse is being kept, do the commandments, then it's obvious that that's proper and good in the eyes of God. Uh, so why do we need to be told the second verse there when the first verse tells us do all the commandments? And the same thing can be said for some of the other um, verses there. You can have a look at them yourself uh, as we go along. Um, and and the, the, the reason that we have this qualification here uh, is that we have to be told do that which is proper and good is because there is a possible way of, com of keeping the commandments of Hashem Shamor tishmurunet mitzvot Hashem elokechem. Keep the diligently keep the commandments of Hashem. There is a way of doing that, and at the same time not being proper and upright in the eyes of God. How could that possibly be? Well, that can be if we misinterpret the commandments. So if we take a commandment and we misinterpret that and do it in a way which is not correct and is not upright and is not straight and is not what God would want, then we have failed. The second pasuk 
qualifies the first Pasuk. And that's where ethics comes in. Uh, because you have to have uh, ethical monotheism. That is the basis of Judaism, ethical monotheism. Monotheism on its own without ethics is not Judaism. And ethics without monotheism on its own is not Judaism either. So these are the, uh, the basics of uh, what we call ethics to make moral decisions, to make decisions based on that which is yashar v'tov, upright and good. Now, those words, of course, are subjective, and that's why uh, we will have various debates as we go along uh, with regards to the, uh, uh, what's considered to be ethical and what's considered to be upright and good. So let's have a look, if you've got your worksheets in front of you, let me see if I can get the worksheet um, up on the screen. Hang on a minute. Um, there it is. Okay, let me just see if I can get that on the screen. Right. Do you have anything on the screen at all? No, you don't yet. So that about that. You should have your worksheet on the screen now. Yeah. OK, so let's just work through this a little bit. Um, ethical theories can be seen as schools of thought when judging the rightness or wrongness of a proposed action or when choosing from a number of proposed actions. OK, so what that means is. Uh, when I said to you what we have to do to be ethical is to be tov v'yashar, good and upright, we have with us a number of participants today, probably about 70, 80 people uh, on our 50-odd computers. And uh, there may well be, uh, out of those 80 people, there may be 80 different opinions as to what constitutes being good and what constitutes being ethical. So we need to have some kind of guidance and various theories uh, have been proposed uh, which uh, enable us to look at various different scenarios in different ways and help us to order our thoughts so that we can come with a consistent approach. And the two theories which are, um, forget the names, the names are just fancy names, consequentialism and deontology. Who, who knows what deontology is? I mean, they're ridiculous names, they don't really matter. But what's important is this. Consequentialism says that there are moral theories that holds that the consequences of a particular action form the basis for any valid moral judgment about that action or in less fancy terms, the end justifies the means. You'll have heard that expression, I'm sure, the end justifies the means. So if the end is uh, justifiable, then the way I get to that might be a little bit dubious, uh, but nevertheless, the consequentialist theory would say it's okay. So it's okay, to, uh, um, to steal if you are going to give that money like Robin Hood to the poor. So the consequentialist theory of Robin Hood would be that that's perfectly okay. You can steal from the rich, even though stealing is a bad thing, because the end point is that money that you've taken from the rich, you're gonna give to some poor soul who uh, needs to buy food with that money. So that, theory, the consequentialist theory, uh, says that the end justifies the means. Now, the other end of the spectrum uh, is the deontology approach. And this is an approach uh, which focuses, as it says there, on the rightness or wrongness of the actions themselves, irrespective of the consequences of those actions. So, to take our Robin Hood, uh, um, analogy, they would say 
it's absolutely wrong to steal from the rich. I'm not interested that you're going to give that money to the poor and that the poor are going to benefit. And it's going to be a wonderful thing that you're going to save lots of lives uh, from starvation by giving uh, this money that you've stolen from the rich to the poor. Not interested. Uh, stealing is wrong. It's intrinsically wrong. It can never be right, despite the, the uh, wonderful uh, consequence that you have in mind for that action. So you have two different approaches right from the start when you are considering um, your actions. So um, we have um, we have here um, the uh, an example in your in your uh, clinical example, uh, which will give us an idea of what we're talking about here. A doctor comes out of a room after witnessing a patient suffering a distressing death. The family approach the doctor and ask if he suffered. The doctor lies and says he went peacefully when he didn't. So uh, you can see right from the start that the, uh, the consequentialist view would say that's a very good thing to do because you have eased the burden of the family at a very distressing time. It's bad enough that they've lost uh, their loved one. They don't need to know that the end was, was uh, horrific. We, see, we saw that in, uh, in wartime uh, very often. I was listening very uh, recently to a radio play, uh, which my good friend Jonathan Raymond gave to me to listen to while I was out walking and running. Uh, and this was a play about uh, uh, a soldier in Normandy who uh, was not able to, uh, to take the, the shelling and the firing, and he killed himself. Uh, he shot himself. Uh, and of course, they reported him as missing in action uh, to the family, and he was painted as a hero that he, uh, that he died in, in action. Uh, and they failed to tell them the truth that actually he had uh, committed suicide because he couldn't handle the stress. Uh, and this is the same thing here. So the consequentialist approach would say that that doctor did the right thing. The deontology approach would say, no, lying is fundamentally wrong uh, and the family are entitled to know the truth, even if that truth uh, is painful for them. Uh, and it is wrong of a doctor wrong for a doctor uh, to tell a lie because lying is fundamentally uh, wrong and it is wrong to expect the doctor to lie. It's wrong to expect the doctor to do a fundamentally bad act in order to, uh, uh, to, to, to bring about a positive action, which is to uh, ease the distress of the family. Now, there, there will be amongst us those that will uh, uh, favor one theory or another. But that in its, in, its most, um, in its most, I suppose, uh, um, rawest form uh, is the, the ethical questions that we have. Uh, and later on uh, in, the, uh, in the session, we will look at the Jewish approach to these two theories and we will come uh, to discuss uh, how we would approach that in practice from a Jewish perspective. So um, let's just run down uh, these uh, ethical principles. There are very, if you put into Google uh, medical ethical principles, you'll come up with a whole bunch of different lists. Um, the list that I've come up with here is my own list com um, combined from various other uh, lists. There are some that, um, that, that list four or five principles. There are others that list 10 or 12 different principles. These are the ones that I have found uh, over the years um, to encompass most of our ethical questions. Uh, and we'll just run through them now uh, very briefly because what we're gonna do on each session is we're gonna take at least one of these principles and discuss them in detail. The case analysis that we do um, each week will be based on one or other of these principles. 
So I just want to uh, briefly go through them. Some of them are very obvious. Some of them are not quite so obvious. Um, beneficence. And you've got the principle of the, the reason I've given you these two here is this is the one that we're actually going to, uh, to discuss today is beneficence and non-maleficence. So beneficence comes from the word, you can see where that word comes from, uh, the same word as benefit. You are, beneficence means that you have to do good for pe a person. And uh, I've given you a, a working definition here. The ordinary meaning of this principle is that healthcare providers have a duty to be of benefit to the patient, as well as to take positive steps to prevent and to remove harm from the patient. These duties are viewed as rational and self-evident and are widely accepted as the proper goals of medicine. Now, you all say to me, well, that's obvious. Surely that's what healthcare providers have a duty to be of benefit to the patient. Um, but what about if you had a situation where um, you had a treatment that might not be of benefit to this patient, but wouldn't do any harm to the patient probably, um, but it might benefit others. In other words, you might be doing research on that, on that treatment. They may be part of a study um, uh, and that will come uh, later when we discuss the issue of consent. But there are many situations in medicine. You might think it's absolutely obvious that every single interaction that you have with a healthcare provider, um, the provider would have in their mind that they must do benefit to the patient. Uh, sadly, that's not always the case. Uh, there are numerous examples of uh, crooked research uh, uh, and research which is done to benefit the researcher, research that's done to benefit the drug companies, uh, research that's done to benefit uh, um, other people's uh, dubious morals. Uh, and sadly, we have uh, we do have this situation where uh, it's not always in the in the forefront of my of our mind. So it, it's it's the first principle of medicine that all healthcare providers must have in their mind that what they're doing must be for the benefit of the patient in front of them at that time. That has to be a an underpinning principle of treatment, and the converse is true. The principle of non-maleficence. Maleficence is the opposite of beneficence. It means doing something bad. Now, I showed you earlier on, um, I showed you the, uh, the Hippocratic Oath. There it is. Where's the red bit? There it is. This is the Hippocratic Oath. Can you see that again on the screen? Yeah. Uh, I will do no harm or injustice to them. So all the way back to Hippocrates, we have the, uh, uh, the uh, I'll do no harm. Here is the, the modern version, the new American version. I shall never intentionally do or administer anything to overall to the overall harm of my patients. So we have the, the, these principles uh, of beneficence and non-maleficence and not doing any harm as the underpinning principles before we go anywhere else. They are the if you like, they are the Shnei Luchot Abrit. They are the two pillars, the two, the two tablets of stone upon which uh, all of medicine is, is built upon. Uh, and, I, and I've given you a working definition here. The principle of non-maleficence requires of us that we not intentionally create a harm or injury to the patient, either through acts of commission or omission. By that, we mean by giving patients treatment uh, that we uh, no might harm them, and we'll come to that in our case in a minute, or omission, or by not giving them a treatment which we know would benefit from them. Now that can be very uh, um, that can be very difficult sometimes, especially when you're working in a uh, either in a national health service where you have a limited budget, or you're working for an insurance company uh, where you are. Uh, given uh, strict rules on what you can and can't treat and what kind of medication you can and can't use. Um, so it, it may be that you're going to fall foul of the principle of non-maleficence without actually um, thinking about it and without really wanting to. Uh, and that perhaps will be a case example that we can use in, an, in a later week. 
Um, so commission or omission. So doing something to a patient or not doing something to a patient that you should. In common language, we consider it negligent if one imposes a careless or unreasonable risk of harm upon another. Okay, so um, this principle affirms the need for medical competence. It is clear that medical mistakes may occur. However, this principle articulates a fundamental commitment on the part of the healthcare professionals to protect their patients from harm. So um, with that introduction, um, I'm going to throw you straight into a case example, um, which is uh, sadly a common scenario. Uh, and I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction to the case example once we've read it through. So this is the case which you've got in front of you, which when we break out into our breakout rooms to discuss the case in a few minutes, uh, these are, this is the case I want you to discuss. And I've given you a few pointers on the bits that you might want to talk about between yourselves. So the scenario is this, a terminally ill patient is under your care. She has increasing levels of pain. By the way, when I say she, it can be a he as well. I'm not being sexist uh, for she, read he or she. It's just a nuisance to keep saying he or she. She has increasing levels of pain which are requiring escalating levels of very powerful opiate drugs, such as morphine. The point is reached whereby the dose of morphine required to ease her pain is such that, is, that there is a very high chance that it will cause re respiratory depression and will lead to the patient's death. So you have a moral dilemma. You have a patient in front of you who uh, requires a certain treatment to relieve uh, her pain and discomfort. On the other hand, you know that this treatment is extremely uh, powerful and potentially life shortening. Um, we are talking today about the concept of beneficence, beneficence and non-maleficence. However, if in your discussions, you want to talk about the issues on the left hand side here of autonomy, consent, truth telling, confidentially, preservation of life and justice, feel free to do so because medical ethics are not uh, uh, confined to boxes in that each of these principles is a standalone. Of course, they are not. They all interact with one another, but we have to start somewhere. And I'm throwing you in at the deep end here. So that's our case. And what I want you to consider are what, first of all, before you tell me what you're going to do, because I know that there are some of you here uh, who are extremely bottom line, who will come straight away and say, he's smiling at me now. I can see him there in, my, in the corner. He's smiling at me. He's going to say, I'll tell you what we'll do. And he's going to tell you the bottom line straight away. Well, before you get to the bottom line, I want you to uh, consider what are the moral questions that you have to uh, uh, grapple with? What factors are you going to consider before you make your decision? And, and then you're going to have to rate those factors in order of priority. You may well arrive uh, at the bottom line, which you thought of right at the beginning. But you may find, after discussion with your colleagues in your breakout room, whom I, I'd like you to consider as your, uh, your medical colleagues in, 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 of equal peerage, for the sake of this discussion. So none of you can pull rank and say, I'm a consultant and you're a junior doctor, right? You're all consultants as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you may find that somebody raises a point that you didn't think of and you might even change your bottom line. So uh, then I want you to eventually, after a little discussion, uh, come to a decision uh, of your group as to how you're going to, uh, how you're going to proceed. Now, so, before I break you out into your rooms, uh, I want to share with you uh, a little bit of history. A little bit of history that uh, I'm gonna see if I can share it. I don't know if I can share this on my screen. You'll have to tell me whether it comes up or not. Um, okay, uh, what can you see on the screen? Anything? Can you see 
uh, a page from Wikipedia on David Moore. You can see that. OK, so um, I'm going to leave that up in case you want to read it while we're just talking now. David, the case of David Moore was a landmark case in British law. Uh, in 1999, David Moore, who was a GP, uh, there is his name at the top there, David Moore without an E. David Moore was a GP in Newcastle who was prosecuted um, for, uh, for murder. Um, the only doctor to date who has been, uh, the only GP who's been uh, prosecuted in the UK for murder. He was acquitted, not, ca not the case, Howard. There may have been others, is that right? He was definitely the first anyway. Um, he was the first GP to be prosecuted for murder. He was acquitted. Um, and his case um, was a, uh, a, a case which uh, hinged very much on the uh, principles that you are all going to discuss now. Uh, very briefly, what happened um, was that David Moore was a British GP. Uh, there was a, a chap called George Liddell, who was a patient of his, um, who died from cancer. Um, David Moore uh, was the treating doctor and gave him a certain level of morphine. Uh, at the time, there was a, uh, an article written in the Sunday Times, published by another doctor called Michael Irwin, uh, on euthanasia. And a young journalist uh, um, whose name was Rick, Rachel Ellis, um, contacted Dr. David Moore and asked Dr. David Moore his opinion regarding this article. David, Dr. David Moore, apparently, allegedly, uh, bragged to Rachel Ellis that he himself had done this many, many times. He had seen off hundreds of patients um, by uh, euthanasia, by giving, them, uh, um, by giving them high doses of morphine. Rachel Ellis warned him that what he was saying was uh, a dangerous things and that could get him prosecuted. Nevertheless, uh, he continued. And anyway, to cut a long story short, um, it went to trial and he was acquitted by a, a jury very uh, promptly. Uh, and there was, uh, 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 this prompted a very uh, deep discussion about euthanasia and about uh, the uh, issue of high dosages of drugs in the terminally ill. Um, and and it, uh, it was a, a landmark case, it was in 1999. And the issues that were really surrounding this case uh, are the issues which I would like you to discuss uh, in our case example here. So uh, um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to attempt to uh, break you out into uh, your uh, breakout rooms. It's random, so uh, it's too difficult with 55 different computers for me to allocate you uh, to who I think you would go with. So it's going to be a random allocation. Uh, there are 55 computers, so I'm going to break you. I'm going to break you out. Uh, uh, Avril, you're waving at me. Do you want to say something? No. Okay. I'm going to break you out into uh, uh, 11 rooms, so there will be five of you in each room. Uh, when you get into that room, you'll see who the five are. Introduce yourselves if you don't already know one another. Um, very quickly. Um, a point for yourself, uh, a spokesperson who's going to uh, report back, not on their own view, but on the group of the view of the group, which you will uh, have discussed uh, amongst yourselves. So the person who is the, uh, um, the spokesperson will probably need a pen and paper to jot down the various points that you're going to make. Um, uh, it's now um, 2039, let's call it 2040. Um, I'm going to give you uh, um, 10 or 15 minutes to uh, to discuss these things amongst yourselves and uh, then I'm going to uh, bring you all back to hear what you've got to say. During those 10 or 15 minutes I'm going to pop in to the various rooms, that's one of the things you can do with this Zoom, you can, the, the host can pop in and uh, eavesdrop. Uh, so I'm going to do that, if you see me come in ignore me unless you specifically want to ask me a question. If you do want to ask me a question uh, whilst you're in the rooms, stick it on chat and I'll try and come into your room. I'm not sure if I know how to do that, but I will try. 
um, and uh, we'll see how it goes. So this, this is the first time I've ever used breakout rooms. So uh, if it's not quite as smooth technically as it should be, um, then I uh, apologize for that. Uh, let's have a go now and see how we do this. Uh, I want to now um, make uh, 11 rooms, recreate, assign automatically, recreate. And now I'm going to open the rooms. You should all go into rooms now. You, will, you may need to press um, accept.
Shelly, why can't I hear this woman? Can you just come here, please? I want to tell them I don't want to be part of this the talking. What do you want, Payne? They put me with this woman, and I don't know how to, to hear her. She's, her microphone's off. Oh. Mm.
I'm sorry we left you behind out of the group. Simon. Hi, good Hi, to see you. Everyone. Everyone. Hi, you good too. to see you. Very, very good. Very well done. Am I the only one back? Oh, no, everyone's back. Johnny, unmute yourself. Yeah. My mute, you? but my, I'm unable to mute anybody, so I think you're going to have to do it. Okay, I will mute. Sorry, you or unmute? There we go. Right. Um, okay, um, we should all be back. Yes, we're all back. Uh, those of you who are on my screen at the moment, you don't know who you are, but uh, could you all just give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down if that worked technically okay? Okay, that looks like most people worked that okay. Good. Okay. Um, I will ask for feedback about uh, whether you enjoyed it or not in a different forum. Uh, but for the moment, uh, what I want to do now is I'm going to just randomly choose four of the rooms. Uh, each one of those rooms, I'd like your spokesman to answer one of the four questions. Oh, yeah, no. Um, yeah, so... Um, What's a good time? So I'm going to mute everybody again. So um, let's just randomly take a room number two. Who was the spokesperson for room number two? Can you unmute yourself and speak up, please? Hi. Hi. Rif hey. Rifka, that was you, was it? OK, right. Rifka, I'd like you to tell me uh, um, what your group thought about question one. What were the moral considerations in our case? What, what, what were the issues that you thought were the most important? Um, I mean, we, we, we talked about this at length. I don't think we came to any major sort of like any, any decisions. We looked at, you, you know, when you popped in, the percentage of chance of shortening life, um, the quality of life of what you're trying to save of the person that you're trying to save and the prognosis and the diagnosis as well. Um, which we talked about whether you just sort of gain consent from the, from the patient previously and their family, whether a discussion had been had over what, what their thoughts were on the matter. Um, you know, uh, you know, if, if it was going to be more peaceful, um, but you had, but the patient had maybe less time in regards to hours or days, if that had been presented to them as a discussion when they were well enough to make that, um, you know, that takes out all of this, um, you know, is it right, is it wrong at the last minute? Um, Let me just stop you there a sec, Rivka. So what you're saying, as I understand it, is that if there was a pre uh, a pre illness directive, okay. In other words, the patient had made it clear what they wanted uh, earlier on, or the family had made it clear what they uh, felt that the patient would want if the patient didn't have capacity. You felt that that would uh, take away some of these moral considerations. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. OK, so uh, I want you all to park that because uh, that's a very important issue, which we will come on to uh, in uh, the week when we discuss autonomy. Uh, mm -hmm. Autonomy meaning does the patient get the choice or not? Uh, and that might not be as quite as straightforward as you might think. So it's important that you raise that issue, but we're going to raise it and park it. Uh, what was your group's thought about um, uh, uh, the percentage question that I asked you? At what point are you going to pull the trigger? Well, I think there was a discussion was raised about, you know, a 100 percent chance of shortening life and likening that to euthanasia. Um, and, you know, all, you know, all the moral aspects of, of that. And what, um, what was the group's feeling about that if it was a hundred percent? Um that th that wasn't halachically how we would be happy with things. Okay. From a, from a uh, 
a Jewish point of view. Um, yeah. Okay, good. All right. Uh, let me thank you for that, Rivka. Uh, sounds like you had an interesting discussion there. Let's um, let's move on and choose group number four. Who is the spokesperson for group number four? Speak up, please, whoever you are. I was. Malcolm, no. okay. Right, Malcolm. Well, <laughs> what did your group think about question two? What factors will you consider when making your decision as to how to treat the patient? What factors uh, okay. were highest up in your mind? So uh, I, I'm afraid our, our group failed miserably in trying to keep the discussion to talking about the four factors specifically. I think we had a very interesting conversation. Uh, and I think uh, clearly a lot of the groups, because some of the issues that Rifka just mentioned, uh, uh, we discussed. So 100%, you know, if you, if you knew the uh, um, an injection was going to, uh, you know, 99% kill the person, that was unacceptable. Um, we didn't attach it to halakha, we just said it's unacceptable full stop, whether from a Jewish point of view or, 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 or not. But when you came into the room and you, you said, you know, we've got to uh, um, look at it from the doctor's point of view, we'll talk about patients uh, another time, and you, you just repeated that. Um, um, the fact is we could not, however much we tried to detach it, you can't, we, we couldn't do it because we said the factors, you say, what are the factors you'll consider when making your, uh, your decision as to how to treat the patient? It's what the patient wants if they can uh, make a decision at that stage. And it's what the family wants. And that's what we consider to be the, one of the most important factors. As okay, long as so, you- So you, what, what you've actually said is you, uh, you said something wrong at the first. You said you haven't stuck to your task. Well, well, you okay. have well, you maybe stuck to your maybe task maybe. admirably. And what you've done is you've said that very clearly that your group felt that the patient's wishes were the, uh, the, the highest factor that was available uh, and, that, and that was the most important to your particular group uh, in making that decision. Um, and, Subject uh, to the and, limit. Sorry? Subject to... Subject to the limit. OK, yeah. subject to the limit. Now, uh, did you discuss where along that spectrum you were going to press the button? Um, <laughs> well, it's it, it's it's it is difficult. We um, like Rifka said, if it was definitely going to do it, that was unacceptable. Um, but in your scenario, you said very high chance. I think, and I can see some of my group, I think we, we sort of thought that that, whatever very high chance means. Um, that was deliberately uh, vague, Malcolm. Yeah, well, exa exactly. It's, it's something less than definite. Okay, I think something was less than definite. Okay, let's, 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 get, let's um, mark that. Something less than definite. Okay, I, I like that expression. I'm going to write it down. Something less than definite. All right. That was group number four. Thank you, Malcolm. Uh, let's have uh, group number seven. Who is the spokesperson for group number seven? Uh, I was the spokesman. Ah, Nachum. Lovely. Yes. Right, Nachum. What, uh, what was group number seven's uh, uh, um, basic philosophy in this uh, scenario, please? Well, you want number three or do you want to talk about the whole subject matter? I would like you to tell me uh, in a two or three minutes, summarize your group's feelings about the case. Well, we spoke about uh, that the patient should not suffer unduly, that the physician should have some major input to, to discuss what this issue is all about with the patient, if possible, or family. The age of the patient, we don't know. We don't know if he's 20 years old or 99 years old. Does that so, make a difference? Well, it could. It could make a difference because if the, the quality of life, which is important to everyone, if the quality of life is, is probably going to be better, uh, possibly better for the young person rather than the one that's in their 90s, 
we have to have a different scenario of what we think we should do. Okay, um, Nahum, uh, remind me when you're in your 90s to ask you that question again. Well, I can tell you of, I can tell you a real life story. Uh, a man was 95 years old and he was uh, suffering and he told his daughter, it's enough, genug. So here we have an older man who had suffered in his, in his feeling enough because the doctor said, what would you like us to do? And she said, you know, Abba, what do you think we should do? And he said, Ganug, it's so okay. Are you saying that, that the decision was made because he was suffering or because he was 95? What if he was 25 and he was suffering and he said, Ganug? Probably wouldn't have had the same impact. So but, it's not really it's not really age based. It's quality based is what you're saying. Quality of life. That was that was the, the major okay, so, point. That so the quality said, of life is a major issue and uh, patient consent was a major issue. Were there any right. other major and, issues that your group came up with? Well, our major issue was give them the morphine. And uh, that's what the group said. I was against that idea because I felt that there may be an alternative to this morphine, which was another kind of medication which had less respiratory problems. And maybe this issue of respir uh, depressed respiration could have been avoided if there would have been a little bit more uh, creative thinking on the subject of, of how to take care of the pain and even though we know this person is terminal, you could extend the life by just trying another approach to the pain reliever, which has a side effect of respiratory depression. Okay, but thank I you. Was, I, I, was, I was overruled. I okay. was overruled. Never mind, never mind. You made your point anyway. It was good that you were the, uh, the spokesperson. One more group I'm going to ask for uh, uh, to, to come up. Who is a spokesperson for group number nine, please? Howard, was that you? Yes. Jolly good. Right, Howard, I'm going to ask you the question directly. Uh, at what point um, did your group think that you should uh, give this dosage of morphine? Well, at we decided, point? sorry, you said that something was left woolly. And we, that's strange because we decided that the, the question had been very carefully framed. It says the point is reached. You might say the point has been reached at which a dose, the dose, is required to ease her pain. There's no, we had a little discussion about whether we could give half a dose and decided that wasn't the question. The question is, here is a dose, I don't know what it is, 50 milligrams or something. The dose can be given, should it be given or not? That I think is the question. And uh, we talked about whether it might be written instructions, any family around, we decided those are extraneous issues to the question. They're not part of the question. So it becomes a trade-off. It's a balancing act between pain and longevity, quality of life and no life, playing God, a doctor playing God and making a decision to bring this life to an end earlier than it would if he didn't give the dose and you're playing God if you don't, because if you don't, then you're condemning this person to several more minutes or hours of pain. So the, the, the decision has to be made. The doctor has to do the best he can. There may be selfish considerations here. The doctor doesn't want to be uh, classed not as like the one that you mentioned, but like Harold Shipman. But all Shipman's patients, of course, were healthy before he came along. So in the end, a decision has to be made. And the decision ought to be that since this life is obviously coming to an end in the very near future, it ought to be come to an end as peacefully and as, uh, with as little pain as possible. And therefore the dosage, which is mentioned here, should be given. Okay. And uh, we, we were in the end, we were unanimous on this. That's great, thank you for that. That, that was very clear, very clear, Howard as I would expect, uh, and 
So what we've got there from, from Howard's group is that a decision was made on the basis that it's a hard decision, but it has to be made. Um, and one way or another, you're playing God either way, and it's a balancing act. Um, so uh, I think that, that you beautifully, Howard, summed up the dilemmas that we have. Um, and uh, I want to spend a few minutes now as we uh, wrap up in the last 10 minutes. Uh, I want to uh, talk now to you about the uh, halachic issues. Uh, that we have here. I left for you uh, on your worksheet an empty piece of paper which says the Jewish approach um, and Avril made me put that, uh, the, that sentence in for participants to fill in if they want after the discussion because she thought that I'd missed it out. Uh, it was deliberately missed out for you to fill in uh, as you go along because I didn't want you to know what I was going to say beforehand otherwise it wouldn't be fun would it? So uh, the halacha uh, is very clear uh, in its principles. What isn't so clear is how those principles are applied. Now, in, uh, the reason that I was um, so uh, keen on getting you to think about the percentage wise, um, and a very high chance is what it says over there in the question, and Howard is right that the question was crafted uh, deliberately using that uh, expression. There is a concept in Jewish law, that we are not allowed to end a person's life. That's called murder. However, if we uh, do an act which is not designed to end a life, but is designed to relieve pain, then that act, depending on what our kavana is what our intentions are when we do the act, that would fall within the principle of beneficence. I'm just going to share the screen with you once again. Um, there we are. So the, uh, the act of beneficence is that the healthcare providers has a duty to be of benefit to the patient. And as I think that uh, Dov Lister wrote in the chat earlier on, um, that means to intend benefit. You have to have the intention. That's the Hebrew word kavana. Um, you have to have the intention to do uh, a positive act. Now, there is also a concept in Jewish law of something called psik resha, which is a, uh, a, a Talmudic term, uh, which literally means a cut off head. Now, what on earth is that got to do with our uh, situation? Let me very briefly tell you the case of psikresha. A psikresha is a halachic term, which means an inevitability. So the example that's given in the Gemara in, in Masechet Shabbat is that a child comes to his father and says, I would like a chicken's head to play with, please, uh, on Shabbat. And the father says, okay, I'll chop the chicken's head off and you can play with the head. Oh, I didn't mean to kill the chicken. I only wanted the head for my children to play with. Well, that doesn't work. You cannot chop the head off a chicken without an inevitability of killing the chicken. Now, the, that is called a psik ratio because that's the example that is given in the Gemara. But it applies halachically uh, to many uh, examples on Shabbat. The classical example that they're given on Shabbat is that you have a um, you have a, uh, a, a a heavy chair, a heavy bench on a lawn, and you want to move the bench from one side of the lawn to the other to sit on it. That act is not forbidden on Shabbat, but if the bench is so heavy that inevitably you're going to rip out half the grass and make a furrow, then you can't do it because it's an inevitability, it's a psik ratio. So uh, if we talk about the idea of uh, the, whether the end justifies the means, then psik ratio comes into account because the end here, in our case, our intention is to benefit the patient. Our intention is to relieve the pain of the dying patient we have a possibility of shortening their life. 
and we have these two uh, things which are in, in, in tension with one another, because on the one hand, we want to relieve the pain. On the other hand, we don't want to shorten their life because shortening their life is called uh, murder and we're not allowed to do that. So how do you uh, judge the two factors? Well, Halakha says that there are two important factors here. The most important factor is kavana, is intention. If you have the intention to shorten the life when you give that injection, then that intention makes you into a murderer because you intended to kill them. And that is not halakhically acceptable. However, that same act, that same dosage, that same act of injecting the morphine into the syringe driver of the patient, done with the intention not to shorten the life, but to relieve the pain is a totally different act uh, in, 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 in halachic terms. The act there is one of kindness, of beneficence, of relieving the pain. Now, if you apply the second, uh, um, the second principle, the principle of psikratia, let's say you give a dosage of a thousand milligrams of morphine, which is inevitable, 100% chance of killing that patient, then that can't be done because it's a psychrasia, it's an inevitability. You can't turn around and say, I didn't intend to kill the patient because that was an inevitability. In the same way as you say, you can't say, I didn't intend to kill the chicken, I just wanted his head to play with. You can't say that, it doesn't work. However, anything less than 100%, anything less than inevitable, as long as you have the right intention, opens the door for you to use this principle of beneficence, this principle of doing right by the patient, sure, you may well have a very high chance that it will cause respiratory de depression and will lead to the patient's death. But unless it is an absolute inevitability, unless the dosage is so high that 100% of all cases would re result in death, then you have the open door. Now, at what point along that sliding scale you will choose to do that will depend on your uh, approach to uh, this idea. There will be some people who will feel uncomfortable about doing it if it's a 95% chance. And there will be others that will say, no, my kavana, my intention is that principle of beneficence. My intention is to relieve the pain of this patient. I am in no way intending to kill this patient. I understand that there is a chance I will shorten his life, but it's not an inevitability. It's not my intention. And that uh, halachically would be acceptable. The difficulty comes where you uh, uh, have where you draw the line on that spectrum, and that will be each individual's uh, decision along that line. There'll be those that will take a, a 99% as okay. There will those there's others that take a much lower uh, a, a much lower idea. Now, what David Moore got himself in trouble with is that when he spoke to the journalist, he indicated that his intention had been to shorten the patient's life. He did not say to the journalist Rachel Ellis that he intended to relieve the pain and that it was not his intention to shorten their life. He made it clear, according to Rachel Ellis at least, he made it clear in his discussion with her uh, that he had a dual consideration and that he had uh, an intention both to shorten their life and he wasn't bothered if it was an inevitability and to relieve the pain. When he went on trial, if you actually look at the transcript of his trial, he changed his story under oath uh, and said that he'd just been silly in what he'd said to Rachel Ellis and it wasn't true. And actually his only intention was to uh, relieve the pain. He had no intention to shorten life 
uh, and that was the uh, um, that was the uh, the tool that was used by the jury to acquit him that he uh, did not have any intention any mens rea in order to uh, to be uh, convicted of murder. So the interesting case of David Moore actually parallels the halacha uh, really quite closely. So just to wrap up, we spent an hour and a half, which is probably about what we're going to do on this course, I'm afraid, because this is the kind of thing that can't really be rushed. So just to summarize now, uh, we spoke uh, at the beginning about these two ideas, these two conflicting ideas of consequentialism and deontology. Does the end justify the means in any way? And we then uh, spoke about the concept of not doing any harm to the patient and that being a, uh, 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 an idea which is rooted in the Torah, in the uh, book of Dvarim five times, you shall do that which is upright and good in the eyes of God. And it's rooted in the Hippocratic Oath. We spoke about that. And in your groups, you discussed this very difficult but very common scenario uh, of the case of a patient who requires ever-increasing doses of morphine. The halachic uh, view, which uh, is summarized by two points, the kavana, the intention, has to be one of beneficence and not one of maleficence, not the intention to shorten a life. There also has to be taken into account the concept of psychratia, the idea of inevitability. Uh, you can't trump inevitability. Uh, so uh, uh, something which is absolutely inevitable, which has a negative end, cannot be necessarily uh, used uh, to, 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 uh, to override uh, the negative side and to go for the positive aspect. So the halachic uh, approach can be summarized by those two concepts of uh, um, kavana and psikratia. So uh, what I'm going to do now is I am going to uh, stop the recording um, uh, and I'm going to uh, open it up for everybody to have questions or to uh, have discussions um, because I don't want that to be on the uh, recording in case people who are asking questions don't want to be recorded. So I'm going to stop recording now. Um, and uh, there we go. We are now 